Um, just a reminder about Sunday, we're going to have lunch after uh, service. We're hoping that uh, we have a lot of guests come and visitors. And uh, we just pray for God to just anoint and touch and move in a mighty way. And we're so thankful for all that the Lord's going to do on Sunday. Also want to remind us about next Friday, which is the 29th, about our community trunk or tree. Um, that's from 6 to 8. So if you want to come and participate, pass out candy and all that good stuff, um, maybe come a few minutes early. And uh, in between now and then, please help us by donating candy. Um, there will be thousands of people there, and so we want to be a, a blessing. We want to make sure we have plenty. So thank you for, for that. Um, also, I don't know yet. They haven't, haven't told me yet. Um, I asked them if they would do that, but it's, it's totally up to them. Um, but they'll let me, they usually let me know and then I'll, I'll put the word out. Also want to mention on November the 7th, we have a missionaries to Kenya coming. Looking forward to that. Um, so just, uh, we, we want to bless them as they come. But just remember a couple of things that they mentioned. Um, they need onesies for the cl clinic. Um, could be could be gently used, she said. Just no stains, have to be clean. That's the only thing she mentioned about onesies. And then uh, just educational DVDs, Veggie Tales, age appropriate um, for for the school. Um, they're in need of that. So if you have either one of those items, or want to purchase some of that, or maybe you know somebody that's uh, maybe, maybe you know someone's getting ready to have a a yard sale and they got a baby that's out of onesies and re ready to get rid of them and uh, sell them to you for a quarter a piece god bless you amen um and let's just be a blessing to them i appreciate that uh and i know they will too uh so let's go to the book of acts three i believe everyone has a paper we're going to read the first 10 verses and then we'll we'll discuss Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, and then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat uh, begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Okay. I did that without glasses. Somebody say praise God. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. <laughs> Peter and John, both commissioned by Jesus, of course. Of course, Peter and John were both Disciples or apostles of Jesus and uh, traveled with Jesus, were taught by Jesus, lived with Jesus, um, traveled place to place with Jesus. They were recognized, uh, of course, by the early Christians as apostles, special ambassadors of Jesus. Acts 2, 43, which we talked about last week, told us, that many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. So this story is a specific example of, of 
basically the general theme of signs and wonders being done. So here's an example of many. We can think of at least three reasons why Luke, of course we know Luke is the author of Acts, that Luke found it important to share of this miracle. First, to give an example of what he mentioned in Acts 2.43, talking about signs and wonders. So here's an example. Secondly, to give an excuse for telling us about another sermon of Peter. We talked about uh, the first sermon of Peter after or actually on the day of Pentecost, but after the falling of the Spirit, we talked about that in length in the last couple weeks. So here's another example of his second sermon, which we're going to talk about tonight. Thirdly, to show why these earliest Christians were persecuted, because that is what this beautiful story leads to. Now, we are actually not going to quite get there unless we have time we could read it, But as we open up Acts chapter 4, we are going to see that Peter and John were arrested for what we're going to talk about in in Acts chapter 3. We're not going to really discuss that tonight, but uh, that's what it leads to. That's the end of, well, not the end, but that's where this leads to. Uh, Luke says, at the hour of prayer. Apparently, Peter and John saw no problem in continuing their Jewish custom of prayer at certain hours of the day at the temple. Now, it talks about the hour of prayer, but there's also an hour of sacrifice. Now, Peter and John went at the hour of prayer, not at the hour of sacrifice. Can somebody tell me why? Because the sacrifice was already made in Jesus. Right? So they no longer had to sacrifice. They didn't have to bring a sacrifice to the temple any longer. But they did come as an example of people of prayer. So they did still continue to go to the temple to pray. Uh, They realized, again, that the sacrificial system was fulfilled in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Just like today, sacrifice is no longer needed. Can somebody say amen? amen. Peter and uh, or the Jewish historian Josephus describes this gate on the Temple Mount made of fine Corinthian brass, 75 feet high. So think about that. This gate was 75 feet high, made of brass, with huge double doors, so beautiful that it, uh, that it greatly excelled those that were, only covered, uh, that were only covered with silver and gold. In other words, there were several gates leading to the temple. And this is what was called, and, and it's in the, in the Bible here, it was called the beautiful gate or the gate beautiful. It was so beautiful, that's, that's the name of it. They named it that. One of many gates. The lame man simply wanted to be supported in the condition that he was in. Now, what, what I, I, again, we read today that someone came and laid this lame man. In other words, he was a beggar. And so he would come to the beautiful gate or the gate beautiful every day to beg alms. Now, we all know what alms is, beg for money, beg for offerings, beg for, you know, coins to, to come so this, 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 this lame man was pr- probably, in, in, in those days, they had what was called beggar's cl- uh, clothes, if you want, for lack of a better term. And he would lay there at the gate begging alms or begging for money. Uh, all he wanted to do was beg money so he could stay in his same condition. So that he could probably buy a little bit of food or, or pay rent or whatever his expense might have been for that day or for that week. But just like God, God had something better in mind. Amen. Jesus wanted to completely change his condition. He was just, he was just happy being in the same condition. 
Coming back the next day to beg some more. Coming back the next day, the next week to beg some more. But Jesus, the Lord, was ready to change his condition completely. Of course, the lame man felt he had no other option than to be supported in his condition. Of course, you know, he was lame. He couldn't go find a job. He couldn't work a job. He had to beg at the gate of the temple. And it was certainly better for him to be supported than to starve to death. So he was begging for substance, for food, for you know, place to stay, you know, whatever his situation was. The man had good reason to believe that begging at the beautiful gate could support him. There was and still is a strong tradition of almsgiving, in other words, giving to the poor, especially beggars, in Judaism. And doing it as an act of righteousness. In other words, the the good deed for the day. Y'all with me? We 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 were going to pray at the temple. We're going to sacrifice at the temple. So we gave a you know this man a coin or whatever, our good deed. The man must have uh, been happy and encouraged when Peter and John looked at him intently. Most people who want to ignore most people who want to ignore beggars are careful to not make eye contact with them. When they looked at the lame man so intently, he probably thought there was a big gift coming. It's kind of like you know you hate to say it in this day and time, you know, especially a big city, any kind of highway you get off, a bypass or whatever. A lot of times there's somebody standing there with a sign, you know, we'll work for food or whatever. And a lot of times, or, you know, even in Perry, there's, I saw one yesterday, I think on 19. Um, we'll, we, I don't know what the sign said because I was in the other direction, but just there. And a lot of times if, if you know, if, if, if we don't feel to give or we don't have, you know, anything to give or, you know, it's, we're not going to, we're not going to get their attention. We're not going to probably make eye contact. If, if, you know, we probably are hoping the light is green, right? Um, I hate to say that, but it's the truth. But if somebody feels like, you know, they need to give or maybe they have something to give, what are they going to do? They're going to get their attention. Come here, you know, roll the window down. Maybe put their hand out the window or something with something in it, right? You all understand. So Peter and John here, especially Peter, got this beggar's attention, this lame man's attention. He wanted him to pay attention. And so uh, when, when, you know, just like, just like in our day and time, if, if somebody's standing on the street and, and somebody's calling for them, or got their, what are they going to do? They're going to a lot of times run over or, you know, say, God bless you, thank you, whatever, right? And so in their mind, they're probably saying, okay, I'm, you know, maybe I got, uh, you know, maybe they'll give me enough to buy lunch or whatever, you know, whatever the need might be. Hopefully it's not, I can go buy beer or alcohol or drugs, right? We, we hope and pray. But the lame man uh, here in our story returned the eye contact with Peter and John. Perhaps he even stretched out a hand or a cup to receive their generosity. So they got the, his attention and just like in our day and time, they're going to reach out. They're going to, especially if you're, you're, you're reaching out, they're going to reach out. The layman was correct in expecting to receive something from them, but he received much more than he expected. Much more than the monetary donation that he was probably accustomed to, that he was used to, that satisfied him every day that maybe met that need for that day you know even maybe for a couple of days many have yet to come to the place where they really expect something from god this is faith plain and simple even if the man expected less than jesus wanted to give how many times do we pray a prayer and we I'm not saying we don't have faith, but maybe we pray it, but we're not real sure God's going to answer that, that prayer. 
you know, maybe, it, you know, I, I'll just give an example. Just a minute ago, I prayed for prodigals, sons and daughters. I'm believing that our sons and daughters are going to get saved. But many, maybe somebody says, well, I've been praying that for years and years, and I haven't, haven't seen it yet. But just keep holding on. But, but isn't it just glorious when God moves and you get that phone call, you know, I accepted the Lord in my heart and, and my family did or, my, you know, my wife, my husband, my children. We, and it just overwhelms you. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Just overwhelms you because God did something greater than maybe even we expected. Um, better yet, we should expect the right things from God. We are often much too ready to settle for much less than God wants to give us. And our low expectations often robs us. Peter said, silver and gold do I not have. Peter didn't have any money, he said. But he did have authority from Jesus to heal the sick. He says, what I do have... I give to you. Peter knew what it was like to have God use him to heal others. Because Jesus had trained him to do this. You remember a couple different times in the Bible. He sent his disciples out. The 72 by 2. He sent them out to heal. Right? To cast out demons. To, to preach. So Peter knew he was trained. Of course, he was around Jesus. He was there for the feeding of the 5,000. He was there for the feeding of the 4,000. Guess what? Peter was there when he walked on the water, right? And so there was many miracles that, that Peter witnessed with his own two eyes and, and was a part of. He was the one out in the water. When Peter and John gave him no money, we might have heard the lame man complain. You don't care about me. You won't support me. Look at the mess that I'm in. But Peter and John wanted something greater than supporting this man in the same condition. They wanted to transform his life by the power of the risen Savior. He gave the lame man power in the name of Jesus. But he could not give it unless he had it in his own life. Many, many people want to be able to say, rise up and walk without having received the power of Jesus to transform their own life. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, we talking about a mission trip. We went to a mission trip to Fiji. Eight, I lost track, eight or nine years ago. And I remember the pastor telling, me, telling us a story. And he had some stories about, you know, people, they have them in the prayer meeting and people crawling under the chairs like a snake and even somebody about halfway crawling up the wall and, and you know, just kind of witchcraft and, and demon possession. But he talked about this, uh, preacher that was there during this prayer meeting and all this was happening and this preacher from Fiji he started talking about you know trying to rebuke this demon and devil and this person I think it was a lady or, or it don't matter talked back to the preacher and said how can you rebuke me when you're having an affair with so and so Talking to the preacher. So this preacher trying to rebuke somebody of, of something when he has sin in his own life trying to hide. And this demonic person, whatever, just spilled the beans on him. And so, you know, it's kind of like what we're talking about with Peter and John. We, we, and I've said it for a couple weeks. We can, we can talk to talk, but we got to walk the walk. We could fool a lot of people, but we're not going to fool, fool God. And even the devil sees what we do in secret, right? 
And so, you know, and, and the Bible talks about your sin will be shouted from the rooftop. And so <laughs> that's something we don't want to play with. And, and if I was that preacher, I, I wouldn't want to play with that at that time if I was in sin. But Peter and John had the power. They had the authority to do what they were about to do or to do what they were doing to this, this man at this instance. Uh, he took him by the right hand, lifted him up. It was one of, it was one thing to say, "Rise up and walk," but it was a much greater thing to do so boldly. Take that man's hand and lift him to his feet. At this moment, Peter received the gift of faith, described in First Corinthians twelve nine. A supernatural ability to trust God in a particular situation. You know, it's a it's a it's a whole different story when you say, "Rise up and walk," and I'll be praying for you, right? But it's another story when you say, "Rise up and walk." Let's do it now, right? Let's let's walk now, and you you're there. I mean, you are there. Trusting in, in, in the Lord and this risen Savior and, and this authority that Jesus placed upon Peter and John. This wasn't something Peter did on a whim or as a pro promotional event. He wasn't trying to promote anything. He did it under the specific prompting of the Holy Spirit. God gave Peter the supernatural ability to trust him for something completely out of the ordinary. The Bible said that immediately his feet and his bones received strength. Strength did not come to the lame man until Peter said, rise up and walk. And not until Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up. In other words, when Peter said, rise up and walk, he didn't rise up and walk. It wasn't until Peter reached out, grabbed his right hand, and lifted him up. He entered the temple. Walking, leaping, praising God. As soon as he was healed. This formerly lame man. Did three good things. First he attached himself to the apostles. That was always a good thing right? Attach ourselves to the Lord. Attach ourselves to, to his servant. He entered the temple with him. The Bible said. Secondly. He immediately started to use what God had given him. Strength in his, his bones, his ankles, his legs. And he started to walk, to leap. And then finally, he began to praise and worship God. He was praising God, the Bible says. Good thing he wasn't praising Peter or John. This man was more than 40 years old. Of course, we're not going to read it tonight. We can read it if somebody has it in Acts 4.22. But it basically says that this man was 40 years old. He, he, actually, he was lame for 40 years. So for 40 years, he had been crippled since birth. Anybody look it up? Want to just read it? I've got it. Go ahead. Okay, so this wasn't a young man. This wasn't a teenager. This man was over 40 years old, crippled from his birth. Never walked ever on his own. For 40 years, he was, and, and this point, I, I really love this point. For 40 years, he was seen at the temple. The gate of the temple. He was, he was begging alms. Now, of course, maybe not as a child, I, I don't know. But for close to 40 years, he was begging. Now, think about this. This was, it doesn't, we don't know the exact time, but we know it was pretty close to the uh, day of Pentecost. It was a little bit after that. We're, we're, we're just the next chapter over, so it's in the timeline. But think about it like this. It was probably let's say three months 
let's just say, after Jesus died and was resurrected. We'll, we'll just say that. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a little longer. But for 40 years, he was there. How many times did Jesus go to the temple? I love this point. Did Jesus ever heal him? Do you think Jesus walked by him at some point or another? Probably many times. And maybe the reason that Jesus didn't heal him at that time is because he needed his apostles to be there at this time. It's, it's, not, it's not only important to be in the will of God, but also in the timing of God. Maybe it wasn't the right time for Jesus to heal him. Because as we, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but as we'll see, there were souls saved, thousands of souls saved, because of this incident. Maybe one reason, I'll just read it. Maybe one reason Jesus didn't heal him is because God's timing is just as important as his will. And it was for the greater glory of God that Jesus healed this man from heaven through his apostles. Miracle. Let's read on. Well, before we do that, anybody have any thoughts or questions or comments? Welcome everyone on Facebook, by the way. Verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly, greatly amazed. They were greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life, whom God raised from his name. Who, I'm sorry, who God raised from the dead. Maybe I should wear my glasses. Of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness, in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did not, that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets and the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you, first God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you 
and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So Peter, after this miracle, after this man joined with them, leaping, walking, praising God. What does Peter do? Just like any other preacher, gets up and preaches. <laughs> any opportunity for us to preach, right? We, we, we do. Since he could walk, it wasn't for support that, that when it talks about that he held on to them, but out of gratitude, perhaps out of a combined sense of fear and surprise. Remember, this man was lame for over 40 years. And then it says that a crowd gathered. Just like in Acts chapter 2, remember? The, the rushing mighty wind, the sound from heaven, the, the tongues of fire set upon them. They all started speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. What happened? A crowd gathered. All of a sudden, this man is leaping and walking, praising God. What happened? A crowd gathered. What is going on? What is the commotion? And it says the people ran together to them, greatly amazed. They, they, they recognized this man. They, they understood what was happening. When Peter, when Peter saw it, he responded. He preached. Peter wisely took advantage of this gathering crowd. Yet he knew that the phenomenon of the miraculous in itself brought no one to Jesus. It merely aroused interest. Though they were greatly amazed, they weren't saved yet. This might have been a good time for a testimony service. For the healed man certainly had a great experience. It would have been a great time for the lame man to get up and, and to testify and, 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 and to, uh, to tell the people what just happened. But it was a good chance he didn't understand what just happened. He didn't understand what happened, who, who actually did this. Peter knew that what the crowd had needed to hear even more than the healed man's experience was the gospel of Jesus Christ and a call to repent and believe. The healed man didn't know enough yet to share that, so Peter did the talking. Peter knew that saving grace did not come by seeing or hearing about a miracle. Rather, faith comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of God, Romans ten seventeen tells us. Peter denied that the healing was due to either his power or godliness. Many evangelists or preachers or even pastors today or even Christians who would uh, never claim to heal in their own power still give the impression that healing happens because they are so spiritual, so close to God or so godly. Peter knew that it was all of Jesus and nothing was of him. Peter's point was simple. Jesus healed all sorts of people when he walked on this earth. So why would it seem strange that he continues to heal from heaven? Peter preaches Jesus. You know, I'm reminded again of Acts chapter 2. I think we have said it in the last two weeks. The Holy, and I just said it a minute ago, rushing mighty wind. Tongues of fire. People speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. 120 people, right? In, in different languages. And that's all wonderful. That's, that's exciting. That's, it's great to have that and to do that. But the bottom line is the manifestation leads to the message. It's not about the manifestation. It's not about the Speaking, it wasn't about all of that. It was about the message that Peter gave in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 people were saved. Right? right? And it's the same thing happened here. A man was healed. And it wasn't about, thank the Lord, thank the Lord for healing. But it wasn't about healing. What it was was it drew attention that now they could preach Jesus. And, 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 you know, as I was preparing, and I didn't quite know Sherry would be here, but since she's here, it, it's the same thing on mission field. 
they do clinics and and prescriptions and exams and all and all of this is good but what it leads to is the message of sharing Jesus and they I'm sure they help thousands of people medically and and dentally and and all of these things but what did you say 15 something 100 people saved praise the lord that's what it was all about it wasn't about all the other stuff i mean that's great don't don't get me wrong but 1500 over 1500 people life changed converted and because it drew drew a crowd they came to get physically well or physically checked but spiritually they were changed and the same thing's happening here. The, the healing of this man, the manifestation of this healing power, it was all leading to the message that Peter was about to preach. Again, God's timing. God knew who would be there. God knew exactly who would be there. Peter says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by opening with this reference to God, Peter made it clear that he spoke to them about the God of Israel, the God represented in Hebrew Scripture. The greatness of Peter's sermon is that it was all about Jesus. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about John. It wasn't even about the layman, the, the, the healed layman. It was all about Jesus. The focus on the sermon, again, wasn't on Peter or anything else or anything he did, but about Jesus. The first thing Peter said about Jesus in the sermon drew attention that, uh, to the idea that Jesus was the perfect servant of the Lord and spoken of in the Hebrew Scriptures. We can go back to all of the prophets. Every book in the Old Testament leads to Jesus. Uh, every, from Genesis to Malachi, they lead to Jesus. Every one of them. Peter again boldly set the guilt of Jesus' death just like he did in Acts 2. Squarely where it belonged, Pilate, the Roman governor, was determined to let him go. But the Jewish mob insisted on the crucifixion of Jesus. This does not mean that the Jewish people of that day alone were responsible for the death of Jesus. We know that the Romans were, Gentiles were, the Jewish leaders were, the Jewish people were all responsible. The Romans would, would not have crucified Jesus without pressure from the Jewish leaders. And the Jews could not have crucified Jesus without Roman acceptance of it. God made certain that both Jew and Gentile shared in the guilt of Jesus' death. In fact, it was not political intrigue or circumstance that put Jesus on the cross. But guess what it was? It was our sin. It was planned from the beginning. It was our sin. That put him on the cross. It was, a no, it was a nobody else. Here Peter exalted Jesus as God. The term Holy One is, is used more than 40 times in the Old Testament. As a high and glorious title for Yahweh. The co covenant God of Israel. One of the ironies. Of the crucifixion of Jesus. Is that while the crowd rejected Jesus. They embraced a criminal. And a murderer named Barabbas. Peter boldly confronted this audience. The prince of life could not remain in the grave. He preached the same, a very similar message in Acts 2. And the apostles were a united witness of the fact of his resurrection. And they saw him for 40 days. Peter said that it was in the name of Jesus that this man has been made whole. This means more than Peter said in Jesus' name. It means that Peter consciously did this in the authority and power of Jesus, not in the authority and power of Peter. Peter would not even take credit for the faith that was exercised in the healing, but it was the faith of this man. When God's people really do good in the world, they do it through faith in his name. The temptation is always to do things trusting in something or someone else, to trust in good intention, to trust in talent and gift, to trust in material resources, trust in our bank account, to trust in reputation or prior success, 
to trust in hard work or smart work. Instead, we must always trust in and do good through faith in his name, in the name of Jesus. Peter recognized they called for the execution of Jesus in ignorance of God's eternal plan. He said the same thing in Acts 2. He said, you did this. You, you, I mean, basically he's saying, you did this. You crucified him. But don't blame yourself. It was God's plan. You were part of God's plan. This did not make them innocent, but it did not carefully, but it did carefully define the nature of their guilt. If we sin in ignorance, it is still sin. But it is different from sin done with full knowledge. Despite all the evil they did to Jesus, it did not change or derail God's plan. God can take the most horrible evil and use it for good. Think about the example of Joseph. His brothers tried to kill him. His brothers sold him for slavery. They, he was a slave. And then he went from, from the pit. He went to be a slave at Potiphar's house, Potiphar's place. And, and then you know, he was, Potiphar's house was blessed because of Joseph. And then, you know, of course, we know Potiphar's wife accused Joseph, and then he ended up in the prison. And then we know the, the story, he ended up in the palace because of interpreting dreams. And at the end of the story, or toward the end of the story, he confronts his brothers and he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And how many times has that happened? The devil tries to take us out. The devil tries to kill us. The devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy us. But what the devil meant for evil, God will turn for our good. Joseph went through all that he went through so his family could be saved. The same principle was at work in the crucifixion of Jesus and is still at work in our own life. We know Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And as he did in his first sermon, Peter called upon the crown, crowd to, what did he do? Repent. Just like Jesus. Just like John the Baptist. Repent. Jesus, repent. Peter, repent. Peter, part two, repent. Peter, acts two, repent. Peter, acts three, repent. He told them to turn around in their thinking and in their actions. Peter spoke boldly to them about their sin. But he didn't just want to make them feel bad. That wasn't his goal. His goal was to make converts. The goal was to encourage them to repent and to believe. Peter knew the necessity of conversion of God's work of bringing new life to us. Being a Christian is not turning over a new leaf to try to be a better person. You know, I, I heard a preacher one time say, God doesn't want you to be a better person. God wants you to be a different person. Makes sense, don't it? He doesn't want us to be better. He wants us to be different. He wants us to Shed all that, that, as he said, if we were in Christ, all the old has passed away. Behold, all things are new. He wants us not to be better. He wants us to be new. This was the first benefit of repentance Peter presented to them. The one who repents and is converted is forgiven for their sins. And the record is erased. You know what he said? It will be blotted out. Thank God for being blotted out by the blood of Jesus. Amen. He said, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This was the second benefit of repenting and turning to God. And speaking of times of refreshing, Peter referred to the time when Jesus will return and rule the earth in righteousness. Peter went so far as to say that he may send Jesus Christ thus implying that if the Jewish people as a whole repented, God the Father would send Jesus in re to return 
and glory. Peter made it clear that Jesus will remain in heaven until the times of restoration of all things. And since the repentance of Israel is one of the uh, one of the all things, there is some sense in which the return of Jesus and glory will not happen until Israel repents. Now, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. Because I believe, and, and I, I mean, I think we believe, hopefully we believe, that during the, that the rapture would take the church out. And what happens for the, what we call the seven year tribulation, is that God uh, turns his attention to Israel. He sends two witnesses. He sends 144,000 to turn the heart of Israel back to God because Israel is still God's chosen people. And so Israel, for the second coming of Christ, that Israel will turn back to God. That is God's plan and God's will. God sends times of refreshing to his people today. We should pray and believe God for seasons of revival and refreshing. I know I do. I hope you do too. The third blessing that comes from repenting and turning to God is being spared this promised judgment. We know that at the end, the judgment, the the road that leads to destruction, a place called hell. And if we repent of our sins, we're part of the family of God, times of refreshing come, and we're also saved from the punishment for our sin. A place called hell. The lame man at the beautiful gate wanted something. But God wanted to give him something much greater. The same was generally true of the Jewish people Peter preached to. They expected the Messiah in a certain way. But God wanted to give them something even greater. They looked for a military and a political Messiah. Even in uh, going all the way to Acts chapter 1, we talked about it. When will you restore the kingdom? Remember that question? Even after Jesus' resurrection. When are you going to take power, basically? When are you going to rule this earth? They were still looking for Jesus to to be a military, a political, a king on the earth at that time. But God didn't come just to save Israel. He came to save the world. He came to save mankind. He came to save everyone from, from the beginning to the end. He came to give something greater, something better. Uh... It shows how important it is for us to expect the right things from God. Pretty good. We finished the whole chapter. Praise the Lord. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Y'all are a quiet bunch. Tell Brother John I need him back. I need his comments. Well, let's pray then. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power. Thank you, Lord, for your saving power. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that that we can come to you. Lord, to repent, to be saved. Lord, to come and have times of refreshing, times of revival in our life, Lord. We're thankful for that. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for the, the plan of salvation that saves us Not only from our sins, but from the penalty of our sins. And Father, we're thankful, Lord, for your healing power. Lord, for your touch. Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, for all that you have done in our life and all that you are doing. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you continue to touch us and help us. Bless our church. Help each and every one of us minister to every need. Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory for all of these things. Lord, I pray as we leave this place, God, that you go before us. Protect us from all harm and danger. Shine your face upon us. Give us peace. 
Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory for all things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, those that are watching. God bless.